Hello again, everybody. It is time for Michael's Record Collection, where we talk about great music with the people who make it and the people who love it. I am delighted to be joined by heavy metal legend George Lynch. George, how you doing? Driving in his van. <laughs> yeah. Down by the river under the bridge. <laughs> we, we all got yeah. stuff we got to get done, man. <laughs> You're just getting stuff done. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, thank you so much for your time. We're here to talk about uh, the new George Lynch and Jeff Pilson album. Heavy hitters Two comes out on Cleopatra records. Uh, August 11th is the drop date for that. This might actually, uh, go, go live, um, a couple of days after that, but, uh, uh, heavy hitters is what we're here to talk about, but I'm going to ask you what I always ask my guests, George, and that was, what was your first favorite record? The first record you fell in love with as a kid. <laughs> hard to remember because you know that was a long time ago i'm old mm -hmm. so that was probably you know like 50 years ago so uh but i do remember uh, uh a record store that i used to walk to when i was a kid i can't re really remember exactly how old i was but um and, you know a little mom and pop place that was probably a couple miles away and i would ride my bike or walk down there and just spend hours looking at all the records um you know there was a group of things that i remember listening to right at the, like one of the first albums i got but i i can't remember what exactly which one it was but i remember one of one of them was was chambers brothers i believe time time has come today okay i think that was that might be you know, I, I just can't remember. Um, you know, I was growing up when Zeppelin was, was this new underground band that nobody ever heard of. You know? yeah. So, <laughs> and we got the first Zeppelin record, me and my friends, and put it on. You know, and, you know, and all that. And the same with Hendrix, same with uh, Jeff Beck Group, same with uh, Cream. Mm -hmm. You know, these are all emerging bands at the time. So, those were some of the first records that that we lived off of and, and fed off of. Yeah. Um, so you obviously you fell in love uh, with music as a kid. How did you translate that into learning how to play guitar? What was the what was the catalyst for you wanting to get a guitar and learn how to play? Uh, well, I was listening to music my dad had was you know had around the house, and it was uh, classical flamenco and uh, some jazz stuff, and he would, and then. Uh, he uh, encouraged me to learn Spanish guitar and flamenco guitar, so that's where I, that's where I started with. Mm. Then, then the rock, the rock came later. Yeah. <laughs> what was that first uh, that first taste of heavy metal for you that made you want to play that type of music? Heavy metal? Well, heavy metal's been a moving target. You know, when I was a kid, there wasn't such a thing. I don't mm -hmm. think, but. Um, you know, the Beatles were considered, you know, rock music and, and things like that. So, I mean, heavy was a different thing when I was growing up. Uh, of course, Sabbath was the first, you know, heavy band that I think really when it started. Uh, so I would say Sabbath. Mm, okay. Um, so how I, I'm going to move ahead in your career a little bit. How did you go? From the boys to Exciter to Dokken. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's just steps, you know, an evolution of just, you know, chasing the dragon and pursuing the dream with your friends, you know. So uh, uh, it's just, uh, you know, I mean, the, you know, the boys was, was, uh, really an extension of the previous bands, you know, that I had and, and Exciter and Dokken were extension, again, extensions of, of that. So really there's a, just a kind of a unbroken line between all of those things. Yeah. Uh, that you make member changes, you know, people come and go for various reasons and, you know, end up, uh, you know, evolving and, and, and trying new things and getting closer to your ideals and, so you change names and you change looks and you change your music and, you know, uh, but the docking thing was kind of a, a, a paradigm shift in, in that whole continuum because uh, that was different. That wasn't, you know, I, I wouldn't have elected to really go start a band with Don. Uh, 
he was a local LA guy, just like us at the time. And uh, so we knew who he was and we played shows and same bills and stuff like that, same clubs. But um, he had an opportunity and we jumped on it because it was an opportunity, not because it was our ideal music situation. Mm-hmm. Or thought, you know, we didn't think it we went for it because it was uh, an opportunity. Okay. You went, um, so, I mean, you had, you had platinum records with this band. At, at what point did you guys kind of know you had something? That is a really slow process. It's like a frog, you know, putting a frog in boiling water <laughs> that you slowly start boiling. I mean, it, the moment of realization was never instantaneous. It was, mm-hmm. you know, it was the old, you know, 20 year overnight success story. It's just, it was very, very gradual. You know, I mean, we still had jobs, and, and as I did, or most of us did, we, you know, we still had day jobs, and um, we had to keep those jobs for quite a while. And, um, uh, you know, we didn't end up starting making any money for quite a while. I mean, it, 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 took a, it took a long time to get to the point where we were actually could say that, okay, we are supporting ourselves with music here, and we're starting to make some waves. and and it's starting to pay off. It, that, that, that took a while. So uh, many years. So, um, and, and it really, that, 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 that the payoff period isn't that long. <laughs> it's not like people think. You know, so. Yeah. But tooth and nail, we were still struggling. Really? Yeah, you, yeah, um... but, you know, you hear that from everybody. I just watched an interview with Van Halen recently, an old interview with them, when, when they reformed with David, and they're talking about saying the same stuff, you know? Yeah, so they were you know, millions of dollars in the hole from the record company and ripped off by their managers. And, you know, the same story we all have, you know, it's just crazy. Yeah. The, 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 the musicians are the last ones, the last ones in line. Got it. Yeah. That's the uh, story as old as time. So you, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, the, as as music. my first, my first exposure to you, a friend of mine put breaking the chains on a cassette for me recorded it and sent it to me and i was like i was blown away so the, my first album was that i had was uh, was tooth and nail from you guys and you were also the opening band in the second concert i ever went to in 1985 i went to see sammy hagar and you guys opened on that tour and uh was blown away fantastic show you do, do you have do you have fond memories of those early tours or was it all kind of a blur or was it arduous? Like what were those early tours with talking like? Well, I mean, there were a little bit of all that, you know, I mean, it was grueling. It would be, uh, you know, on the road constantly. So, so away from home, it was hard to maintain a family. I'm a family man. So I have kid children and, you know, wife and everything so that you know, it, that, that was hard and uh and you're trying to build this career and it's grueling you know and it's a young man's game and you know, we were younger back then obviously so we were able to deal with it but uh, yeah and then and, and it was also uh incredible you know i mean playing in stadiums and, and arenas um we were very fortunate that we that we had those all those opportunities, you know, because we opened up for almost all the major acts on the planet. Yeah, uh, in a ten year period, so um, that's really what made us was was the road work. Yeah, and we backed it up with with good records, but you know, kept ourselves out there and kept hacking away, and and uh, so we did we we put in our time and we and we did the work. Yeah. You a couple of records into your doc and career, you guys end up with a theme song from a horror movie. How did how did a Nightmare on Elm Street three Dream Warriors uh, theme song come about? Our manager Cliff Bernstein, uh, Q Prime, a very powerful manager, and we loved him. And we, I, just to back up for a second. We, I would if I had to give one person the credit for our success. Uh, I would say it would I definitely say it was, it was Cliff. Mm. Um, you know, so uh, that was one of the things that he brought us. Um, and it was kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, I mean, it was great. It was a great promotional device. 
but one of the huge caveats was he said, the deal that I made was that you're not going to get any money for it ever. So that was very unfortunate. I'm like, well, isn't that the kind of one thing that really matters? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, it just fascinates me how, you know, it's okay for musicians not to get paid. But, uh, anyway, so we, uh, Jeff and I wrote the song and, uh, you know, did well, uh, and it did well for us in, in that it, it heightened our uh, you know, people's awareness of us. We got more attracted, more fans, and got exposed to a bigger audience. So it, it did its work. Um, but to this day, uh, none of us have ever seen a nickel from it. Yeah. Not really right. I don't think, I don't think that should be allowed, quite honestly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's, that's very surprising that you guys didn't get a dime for that. Yeah. We, we had to give up all our rights to any publishing or writers or royalties or anything uh, or sync rights for the movie or anything like that. Wow. All right. Well, really... I, uh, I, I'm not going to talk about any, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not interested. Yeah, I thought you were going to talk about bad stuff. I'm not what? interested. I'm not interested in bad stuff. I'm not interested in like the politics of the band, but I am interested to know, was there always tension within Dokken or did that come after a few years was there always a little bit of tension in the band or was that something that kind of came in after you had some success well there was a there was a there were points of contention between i would say the three of us and versus don <laughs> there was an adversarial situation of his own making because it was always something to do with money and uh it really wasn't anything personal, wasn't anything creative. Uh, it was just always about being fair and being honest and doing the right thing. Uh, and uh, that was the struggle. George, you uh, you were named number 47 on the 100 greatest guitarists of all time by Guitar World magazine and number 10 on the top 10 metal guitarists of all time by Gibson did those lists mean anything to you? Only if I'm ranked highly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Otherwise, I discount them as, you know, fake polls. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, that, that's such a, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's human nature to categorize things and pigeonhole things and, and, and grade things. And, but I think that's just, it's not realistic, you know. I mean, you know, it's comparing apples to oranges. I mean, you, can't, you know, how do you say one style is better than another or the technique is better than feel? I mean, there's all these different, you know, it's, 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 it's all subjective. And mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's fun to look at and, and, and talk about and it's fun to compile these lists. But I don't think you can take them too seriously, whether they work in your favor or not. You know? yeah. I mean, I remember in the 80s, I... Uh, you know, a lot of guy, a lot of guys that were in the hair in the hair era. Uh, you'd have these lists on these uh, uh, rock magazines, and you know, number uh, you know the top guitar players, and they were always reflective of the most popular bands. It didn't really matter about the person's guitar abilities at all. Mm -hmm. You know, Mick Mars and 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 C. C. Deville would be up there with everybody else you know and i'm like well you know there's nothing against those guys but i mean i don't see them being the top of the guitar list you know mm -hmm. necessarily and you know and I'm, i shouldn't uh, make examples of any specific names but um yeah it's really it's almost an impossible thing to grade people i mean yeah e even to say who's the best of all time i mean you know what is what a silly question it almost doesn't mean anything yeah, but well, that's why I ask because it's uh, to me it's you know music's not a competition it's not a it's not a sport it's not you know there's not winners and losers so uh, it just that's why I ask if it's uh, if it means anything to you I know it's 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 always nice to get honored but um, you know it's it it always right. I'm always curious about things like that like if if that stuff gets it, paid attention to it's wonderful to be recognized I couldn't cite what you quoted me I didn't know that and I'm very appreciative that I'm even recognized and I'm in the list, you know, I mean, that's awesome for me. I mean, I, uh, 
do I deserve it? I don't know. I could argue for or against it, I guess. If I, but it really is a kind of a silly question, you know, whether I belong there or not. I don't know. Um, but you know, I'm one of those guys, I guess. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in the pantheon, so to speak, and I really do appreciate that. And I try to uh, honor that by living up to that and, and respecting it and doing the work, you know, so, mm-hmm. you know, making music and, and making sure that my, you know, I'm keep I'm, I'm, I'm playing up to my abilities and if not beyond, if I'm lucky enough uh, to be inspired and, um, and, you know, to remain driven and inspired and have fun with it, you know, and, and not to take it too seriously, yeah. <laughs> you know, as well. So, so, you know, I know I'm not the greatest guitar player in the world. I'm not even, and, and, but yet I do know, I think that I, that, that, that my music is valid to some people, mm. you know, it matters to some people. And I, and that's, and I'm very appreciative of that fact because I know there are a lot of people which much more ability than my, my that, that, that are much, much less fortunate. So, um, uh, I don't think, you know, I try to keep that perspective <laughs> mm-hmm. in my in my in my daily life. That's good. Um, moving on, you you um you design and build guitars, Mister Scary Guitars. Um, are mm-hmm. you still are you still doing that now? Absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a big part of my life. Is 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 uh, you know uh, I, I uh, this year uh, I changed sort of my business model. And I've been doing this about 10 years now, I think, or maybe more. Uh, and I have a shop and, you know, pretty well-equipped shop and, and an office and, uh, you know, a couple people that I, a few people that I work with um, sort of on a rotating basis. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, you know, I got a little overwhelmed with the business. Uh, I'm not a, necessarily very good businessman in fact i know i'm not so i don't i'm not good at keeping records and and and, you know all the computer stuff and all that stuff you're supposed to do Uh, i'm just sort of just shooting from the hip so i i kind of stopped doing not entirely but uh really scaled back on you know making custom models for people per you know individual orders Mm -hmm. because it it's just very you know, you have, you really have to be, you, have, you really have to pay attention and focus. And, and as I get older and I'm doing so many things, I've got nine records coming out this year. I'm, on, I'm doing, uh-huh. you know, a hundred dates a year. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've got this Mr. Scary guitar business, you know, and I've always got, you know, 20 or 30 orders at any one time and I'm not keeping good paperwork. So what, I, what ended up happening is, um, as I've gotten older, I've gotten a little, not not as good as, as following all the details. So I've made some mistakes. And with some people, that's okay. They go, hey, you're George Lynch, and you're still building it, you know, yourself, and it's beautiful, and it plays great, it sounds great. And then there's some people, and understandably, they're spending a lot of money. And if I'm not crossing every T and dotting every I correctly, um, they could become unhappy with me. And I got tired of that happening. It happened a couple few times. And, uh, you know, uh, I had some, I made some people unhappy and I had to, I had to refund some people and, and, and it, you know, I don't need that. You know, I don't want that. And it's not their fault. It's my fault. But, um, so I changed my business model a little bit and uh, I talked to some friends that are luthiers and in the business at bigger guitar companies than mine. I find a very small boutique kind of, you know, thing. Uh, so what I'm doing or what I'm trying to do is just, I just now at this point, I just build whatever I, whatever I feel like building mm-hmm. and whatever I'm inspired in it. And it could be anything. I don't know what it's going to be till I get my hands on it usually. And I just start playing with it and it usually comes out pretty cool. And, and, and then when I do that, I'll put them up for sale. Okay. And if you want it, you buy it. And then that way I don't have to deal with, Oh, you know, this color isn't quite right. Or the, that, little detail isn't what I wanted and then I which <laughs> uh, is maddening and, and so I'm not really equipped to to do the, all that anymore so 
yeah. I like this business model better, and it's been work, working out pretty nicely. So good. Um, yeah. So I, I, I got some things out here in New Mexico. I'm working on. I just did. I just finished one. Actually, it's a desert scape. I actually just painted a whole desert scape on the guitar, and uh, now I'm doing some kind of um, wood burning on it and engraving. I'm kind of messing with that and and. Uh, you know, I put a torch on it and kind of do painting with a torch. And it's all, you know, see how it works out. Yeah. Uh, I did show it to one person who thought it looked like a, an eight-year-old kid did a, a finger painting. <laughs> 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 Hopefully somebody will like it. I don't know. If not, here's the thing with my guitars. If they come out, if something happens where they go sideways, and that has happened a couple of times, where it just doesn't work out. The vision, you know, you, you kind of start on, you have the high hopes, and it just ends up being this catastrophe. If that happens, the worst thing that I have to do is sand it all off and start over. It's not the end of the world. It's wood. Yeah, there you go. How many do you yeah, think you yeah. make a year? Uh, you know, uh, again, I'm such a bad business person. I couldn't even tell you that. I would say maybe 30. Okay. Maybe maybe. 25. It's not bad though. I mean, you as busy as you are doing them by hand, that's pretty amazing still. Oh, oh yeah, I'm telling you, that's why I love doing it. But the other th the thing is, it's so it's really a struggle to go. Okay, I'm I'm in the middle of this. So I got my head in it, and now I got to pull myself away and go fly and go on tour, and then I got to go in the studio and put my head in this and create an album, and I really, you know, and then go back to the shop and put on my apron and, you know, get out my tools. And I'm like, it's just, uh, I don't know. I don't know how I get myself into these things. My wife actually gets very upset with me. Uh, she thinks I'm insane. So whatever. <laughs> I guess I am. I don't know. All right. I, I just want to do it all. And, and I, I, can't, I have a very hard time saying no. Yeah. And I have to learn at my age to do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I exactly know what you mean. I've got way too many hobbies of my own that uh, I do at, when I get home from work. And then I realize that I haven't done anything productive. So let's uh, let's jump ahead to Heavy Hitters 2 on Cleopatra Records. Of course, the follow-up to Heavy Hitters. And this is yourself on guitar, Jeff Pilsen on bass, George Lynch and Jeff Pilsen. And for this one... You brought in Bernard Fowler, the Rolling Stones backup singer, a uh, very good vocalist to do the vocals. You got Brian Tishy on drums. And Corey Glover of Living Color does guest vocals on Smokestack Lightning on this thing. How did you decide, or maybe how isn't the right word, Maybe what made you determine that you wanted to have a consistent singer through the record rather than bring in various guests this time? Well... I think because we, Jeff and I talked about it, we wanted the consistency of a band versus this whole litany of guests, guys floating in and out. Mm -hmm. Because I think when we, at the end of the day, you know, it sounded like a good idea. And then at the end of the day, when we were done with the record, it was like this kind of a hodgepodge and it's like peaks and valleys. And wait a minute, I'm sort of getting into this. And now we're a complete change of scenery and it's, it was very disconcerting to listen to without any kind of consistent continuum throughout the, the you know, this body of work. Mm -hmm. It was just like all these kind of things thrown in that had no connection to each other. And um, maybe I'm being hypercritical uh, in the way I'm explaining it and, and describing it, but um, I don't know. I, I And, you know, I just thought, I just thought, you know, let's just find a singer we really love and let's just let's just have him then he can interpret things differently, maybe. He might have a different style on this one song than that song. But at least we're not like, okay, we got an opera singer and then we got a heavy metal singer. <laughs> mm. And the other thing, the other problem we had with the first record was uh, I don't think it's a problem, but the thing that kind of was a little disconcerting was that when you work with so many different people, not only is it logistically very, very challenging, and that was another thing actually we had to think about. And uh, but the other thing too is that when you're dealing with that many singers, you know, you're talking 10, 11 singers, you know, you don't know what you're going to get until you get it, and that's too late. And there were some disappointments on that last record. There were some guys I'm not going to name any names, but there were some guys that came to the table and they just 
we didn't get their A game. And there's no do overs, you know. Yeah. And uh, so we didn't have that problem with Bernard, obviously. Yeah. You know, he's, a, he's a pro. It's just it's just beautiful to work with, and his voice is just incredible. I love it. How did you meet yeah. Bernard? Where 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 did you two cross paths? Um. Well, you know, working in L.A. in the music business, you run into everybody. You know, at some point when you're in the biz, you know, in the studios and shows. And so we'd run across, you know, and we'd run uh, into each other uh, frequently, you know, over time. And we always, you know, we always do the inevitable, hey, exchange numbers and we got to work together sometime. And, you know, 90% of the time that doesn't work. That doesn't happen. But mm -hmm. uh, in this case, it stuck in my head and and uh, Jeff and I were just kind of you know, wheels turning. We're trying to think how to do this. And, and I threw his name in the hat and that's the one that paid off. And he, you know, he made it easy because he was a hard worker and he, and, uh, he's just a sweet, sweet human being and really bent over backwards to make it happen. You know, and that, that really helped. So that was wonderful. We didn't have to deal with any of the LSD stuff or anything like that, you know? So, mm -hmm. Well, not, not not the drug, the, the, the finger disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I knew what you meant, but I'm I am glad you clarified for my audience. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So twelve songs. Yeah, because we were on acid the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> twelve yeah. songs. Eleven of these are covers. Now, how did you land on these particular songs? Did you each bring songs in, um, or or come in with a list and then you combined them and and weighed the pros and cons? Did you have to agree on them together? How did that work? Yeah, it was tough. You know, it was tough. Tough for a little down a list, you know, because we had, it was not just Jeff and I. We reached out to a lot of people for uh, advice mm -hmm. on uh, songs. We didn't want to miss anything. So uh, Brian Titchy was, is, he's sort of a musicologist, Brian. He's an encyclopedic knowledge of music and, uh, and the history of rock and everything. Uh, so he was very helpful. A lot of great ideas. Uh, I can't really remember who thought of what songs and what we ended up with, but uh, the label was also uh, involved, mm -hmm. and we asked for their involvement. You know, it wasn't like they were imposing it. We were happy to have have their input. We like them being involved. You know, it's their money, <laughs> so uh, and we want them to be happy. So, um, and we respect them. You know, I mean, you know, especially when people know their limits. Listen, I know my. I don't try to exceed my what I know I can do, you know, I just, I'm not the best at picking songs. I'm, you don't want me doing everything. So I do, uh, I do really appreciate outside help and opinions. Yeah. Let's talk a about the, involved. let's talk about the original song. Let's talk about it's a wonderful life. What, uh, what prompted you to write a Christmas song? Well, Jeff and I had always talked about it in Dawkin and, uh, it never, I don't think happened. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a, it's a good business thing to do. It's a good American marketing thing at Christmas time. Come up with a Christmas song, you know. It can pay off. So, uh, but we wanted to write something that wasn't corny. Yeah. And jingly and, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, uh, and I think, so that's, that's kind of an interesting balance to try to achieve. Uh, this isn't, you know, opening the presents Christmas morning with Santa, Santa Claus, you know, coming down the fireplace with a bag of toys. This is, this was more of a kind of a sober, kind of an adult way of looking at at, at life, and and, mm -hmm. and and with a positive, you know, uh, with a, at the end of the day, you know, uh, being hopeful and uh, being appreciative that we have, you know. A limited time to spend experiencing this lifetime you know? mm -hmm. so uh so why not make it wonderful <laughs> you know mm -hmm. be dumb to do anything else you know so uh so i think that's, that's probably the point just off the top of my head again mm -hmm. i remember it's funny when we do these interviews i mean these are records that are way in my rear view mirror yeah you know, when, when probably, did you record this when 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 was I, 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 I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you. It had to be a year ago or something, right? Yeah. So who knows? But, um, you know, I've done quite a few records before, right around that and since then. So uh, we've got the, the 
Jesus, the Sweet and Lynch record, uh, the, the Lynch Mob record, Babylon is coming out. Uh, we got a, a guitar instrumental record, Guitars at the End of the World, is coming out uh, very, very soon. Uh, there's probably a couple others I'm already thinking about. Yeah, you're a busy guy. So, <laughs> well, the, the point being is like when you're in it, when you're in it, you're in it, you're, you're living it, and you're consumed by all the details of the writing and the and the process, right? Mm -hmm. But when once you deliver it, it's it's really out of out of out of your head because you're already moving on to the next thing. Um, I don't I, I don't have a. a this, this, I don't have my catalog memorized, and 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 that goes for Doc and, and Lynch Mob as well, mm -hmm. because the guys will bring up a song and they'll be like, "Oh, you want to you want to play this song?" I'm like, "I don't remember that song. <laughs> I don't remember how it goes." I mean, something that I wrote because I write everything kind of off the top of my head. It's not like I sit there and work it out in a laboratory and it's cemented in stone. I just sort of it's just kind of a moment that comes and it goes, you know, and so I'll I'll write it and and we'll. And then we'll we'll document it on you know record it and then that's it. And the only time I remember anything is if I have to relearn it to play it live, which obviously uh, happens, you know, but to very few songs. Yeah. You know, like all these records. I mean, if I got nine records coming out this year, some of them are reissues, but let's say you know, say so each record is eleven songs. That's a hundred songs. So out of those hundred songs. How many am I playing live? Not Maybe two. Many. Yeah. There's two songs on the, the coming out uh, on uh, uh, that are on the Lynch Mob record that's coming out in October that we're playing in the set, and we have been playing it in the set. Those are new songs. But other than that, everything is you know Wicked Sensation and Dawkins songs, you know, and just the hits. Yeah. So uh, you know, it's. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing when people ask me to play some old stuff and I, I don't really remember it. Um, and uh, I feel a little guilty about that because I feel I probably should know all this stuff. <laughs> um, you know, in fact, I was doing a guitar clinic in India. This is a, kind of a weird thing. And I, this really bothers me. That's why I bring it up. And, uh, you know, as I traveled throughout India and I'm playing these kind of theaters and stuff and oh, it's just me playing the tapes, I think, I, from what I remember. But all these people showed up like it was a concert. And then I, I, I was ready to walk off stage, and I finished, and they had some questions. I guess I did some Q&A. And, and then, then I was walking off stage, and the, and the guy, interpreter, called me back, and he says, and one last question. The person wants to know if, before you leave, you'll play Hotel California. I got, you know, a 1,000 people or whatever it is. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know it. Wait, but you don't know Hotel California? Okay, well, how about Stairway to Heaven? Oh, sorry, I don't know that. Oh, you, what? You don't know Stairway to Heaven? Well, what about this? What about that? I'm like, wait a minute. I realize I don't know any songs. I don't know any cover songs. Uh, and it was actually, it was a, the audience was kind of disappointed, and as they should have been. And since then, I go, okay, I have got to learn Hotel California. I'm a guitar player. That's just like a thing that you got to know when you're a guitar player, of course, right? Yeah. You probably know it, right? The lady, I'm, I'm parked in front of a freaking furniture store. The lady that, you know, the furniture store probably knows how to play it. I mean, I don't, everybody knows it. So I, I, I committed to, to learning it. And that was probably 12, 14 years ago. And I just figured it out recently. Good took me 10 years yeah well now you know it it's a hard song dude <laughs> i don't know sure. it perfect i'm I know, sure it right? is I'm i mean sure don't put me hard. on the spot here <laughs> yeah i do it i do my version of it yeah. i it's mean very loosely based yeah. i mean joe walsh and don felder they're not bad <laughs> oh my god i mean what a beautiful beautiful guitar solo yeah. if in my lifetime i could write one thing close to that i feel i've accomplished something but that's that's a big, uh, that's a big lift. Yeah. Well, I think to many people, you have achieved that in, in, in your own way. So, uh, so that's something you can be proud of. So these, these covers are, I'm, I'm impressed with the, 
with the diversity of these songs, you've got Crosby, Stills, and Nash. You've got Peter Gabriel. You've got Howlin' Wolf, Sam and Dave, Sam Smith, NXS, Tears for Fears. It's great to have the Rolling Stones on there with Bernard Fowler. Um, Sly and the Family Stone. I mean, this is – was it important to you guys to have a variety of – of different styles, but still make them your own, you and Jeff? Well, our biggest love is for R&B music and, and, you know, blues music and old country, and, you know, just like all the organic, real stuff that everything else was built on. That's what we grew up with, and that's, what, that's our first great love and can still continues to be. So having the luxury of having the option to pick songs, we really – kind of by default just went to the R&B stuff quite a bit, you know, the funk stuff, the R&B stuff. Because, you know, back in the docking days, believe it or not, we were probably like the least funky rock band on the planet. But uh, that's what Jeff and I would just, especially me, that's just all I would listen to, you know. It's just all the greasy, bluesy R&B, you know, all that stuff. I Just to this day. That's what inspires me, um, and uh, so we had a. It was so much fun to be able to go and do those songs. Now, of course, what would what would be challenging and beautiful for me, just personally, just for my own enjoyment, would be to try to do them in a more traditional way. You know, with you know that kind of recording, you know, to tape with the old gear and and do it really funky and have it be analog. But that's not what people are buying. You know, I, at some point I have to accept the fact that I am a, a product and I have a certain brand and style. And if I veer away from that too much, like smoke this or other things I've done that are kind of left to center, people reject it and they, and they get kind of upset, you know, because they're like, hey, that's not what I, that's not what I bought. That's not what I expected. Yeah. What the hell? I, I, I'm returning this. You know, it's like Coke. Don't change the recipe. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, I, I we're, we're aware of that and and sensitive to that. So, so we try to do these songs that we love and make it worth redoing too, because doing them in a different style is interesting. I think for people, you know, I mean, why do it the same way? I mean, you can't beat a Sam and Dave song or a Wilson Pickett song. You can't beat that. <laughs> I mean, it's perfect the way it is. So, doing it in a different way is maybe valid and worthwhile you know and of course we got bernard singing it so that makes it very very legitimate so yeah but yeah now we were just honestly with these records these heavy hitters records we are just having fun we're having a blast we're living out our fantasies quite honestly so. that's great and it's great to hear you know it's always great that you when you and jeff work together it's uh you've obviously kept your mutual respect and friendship going through the years Oh yeah, yeah, we love it. we love each other and we love working together. You know, we we live down the road from each other. We live a couple miles away from each other, so we're uh, finding any opportunity we can to to work together because we love it. We just it's, I mean, we get in a room together and it's magic. You know, we have a chemistry uh, from docking from day one, and that has never changed. It's like timeless, and uh, we may not be. Uh, uh, Lennon and McCartney, but we got our own little thing that we love doing and enjoy it. And, and uh, we, I, I'd be doing back-to-back -back records with Jeff if I could the rest of my life. That's great to hear. We just read each other's thoughts. We don't. We finish each other's sentences. We're like an old married couple. <laughs> you know? And we and we just have so much fun. We just we're just laughing the whole time. We're just fucking around and, and making jokes. And, yeah. and, uh, but we're serious, you know what? Uh, obviously about our, what we're doing but um but it is an, an enjoyable you know it's not a grind that's good to hear so george lynch from docking from lynch mob from sweet and lynch from tnn on and on and on i want to be respectful of your time i thank you so much for your time and and, and telling me about your you know your career and your your new record uh, heavy hitters too i hope it's a success for you thank you so much well thank you and thank you for uh agreeing to allow me to do this interview in the in my van <laughs>